Okay. So tell me, just as like the first question, what your childhood was like. I can answer that in one word, lonely. Okay. I was an only, I was an only child and we didn't live in a neighborhood with other kids. I didn't have any cousins or anybody around. And uh, when I was seven, World War II had started and my father joined the Army Air Corps and was gone for three years. So it was my mother and me and, my, and her mother, my grandmother. And um, I was a very shy kid and I wasn't cute. And <laughs> and I, my mother sent me off to kindergarten where I was supposed to get socialized. And there was little, oh, boom. <laughs> so much for my lighting effect here. Um, there was little, little Janie and Janie is adorable. Janie has curls and she doesn't have, her teeth don't stick out. She isn't wearing glasses and, and her mother sends her to the Halloween party in a little pink tutu and my mother sends me in a clown costume. So, <laughs> so and that was kind of, you know, that was a story of what it was like for me when I was a kid. Uh, in grade school, everybody made fun of me because I wore glasses and all I wanted to do was read and I could not catch a ball or hit one or fit in in any of the ways that kids are supposed to fit in. So it was a really lonely time for me. Did your did your dad come home at all during well, this? He, he, yes, he came home when I, was, when I was 10, which was great. But you didn't see him for three years without yeah, him coming at home? Yeah, age of seven seven to ten and they're pretty critical years in a, yeah. a little girl's life she needs a dad around and my dad was always there for me he thought I was perfect my mother had different ideas she felt that I needed improvement on every level I was not the child that she had hoped for my mother was a trained musician and I couldn't find <laughs> see <laughs> middle C on the piano. <laughs> I was just, well, actually, I was supposed to perform for one of her friends and I had practiced C scale. And I had marked middle C with a booger and she washed the piano keys and I couldn't buy middle C. And, you know, I, so that was my first recital, total failure. <laughs> what, um, do you have a fond memory of your childhood at all? Something that brings you encouragement or comfort at all? Um, well, my father was, you know, once he got home, I mean, he, he was always there for me and always supportive and always thought I was just fine. And, you know, that I, I carry that with me. Did you guys do anything special together when he got back? I remember at this, and this was just as he was leaving. He okay. would come home. When he would come home on weekends, he was uh, we were living in central Pennsylvania where I grew up, and he was he was at in Washington D.C. waiting for his overseas orders. Okay. And he was and that was not too far. You could drive there in a few hours or take a train. And he came home on weekends until he got his orders, and we would hang out together. And I, and I would go around with him to do whatever he was doing and you know, hang out with him. And then my mother and I would drive him to the to the railroad station and he would get on the train. And my last view of him would be standing on the platform of the train waving to me. And for many years afterwards, and still at times, memories of that. Uh, if I have to, for some reason or other, cry for a performance, that's that's the emotion and the image that I pull up in my mind of my father leaving. And it's it's quite powerful for me, but mostly you know when when he was around, it was it was great. It was just when he left, me, it was really hard. Was there um, something your mom or dad said to you that you remember that stuck out, or it could be negative, it could be positive that you still remember? Well, most of what my mother said to me was was negative, and yeah. I, I've spent most of my life trying to to use that in my you know the stuff I've written and uh, I've put together a couple of uh, hour-long performances that I you know 
done for big audiences. And it's, <laughs> I mean, she's a perfect villainous one. And <laughs> it's unfortunate you had should have sweet memories of your mother. I <laughs> don't, I just have sour ones. Yeah. But they work for me now. They work for me now because they're material. How about your dad? Did he say anything you remember? No. Yeah. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I know you're writing a memoir. What are you able to share what you're going to title it and why you're choosing that title? The working title is The Old White Lady Tells It. The Old White Lady Tells It? Why that title? Well, that was actually the, the title of my, my second solo performance. Okay. And and, uh, and, it, and it works because I'm an old white lady. And I have, I have a, the theme and running through that one is racism and how, how it has confronted me in different ways at different stages of my life. And mm. it was working, just a working title for, for all of that. What I grew up in a, in a very racist family, as, as many families were. They cer certainly weren't relegated to the South. I was in central Pennsylvania, but, you know, we had a handful of Black people. We didn't call them Black. We called them Negroes when we were being polite. My parents I, weren't polite. So, and it's the memoir will focus a lot on the racism you experienced or oh no no uh the the, the milieu of my family and and the social the social the world that i grew up in was very racist yeah and the problem my pro, my processing of all of that how i reacted to that when i was in college mm. And wrote a, uh, my, I remember one of my first essays in college was um, in favor of separate but equal schools. Why, yeah. would, why would little black kids ever want to go to, to school with white kids? They just feel out of place, wouldn't they? And that was my whole thesis. Things should stay the way they are. I changed a lot after that, but that's what it was. I was going to ask you, how did you change? Was it when you moved out of the community or? I've experienced, you know, I've lived a long time by then. Yeah. I was born the same year as Elvis Presley. Or whatever that's worth. <laughs> 1935. So I'm 88 and I've seen a lot change in the world. Yeah. Some, some of it good, some of it not so good. Not good at all. Is there anything about the world you want changed that you would change if you could? Oh my God, yeah. Where, where, do, where do we start with Putin? I mean, you know, I think the international situation is awful. I find the, the swing to the extreme right terrifying. You know, I, re I remember World War II. I lived through that. And here we go again. With, with all the setups for that. Oh, my God. And the, you know, the, the, difference between the haves and the have-nots in the world, in our country, in my community. And yeah, I'd like to fix all that. How do you but, think you'd fix it if you could? I don't know. Money helps, you know. It does. Yeah. Donate it to good causes. What do you think makes life hard? For you, like personally, what do you think is hard about living? Uh, losses. And I, I'm old enough to experience quite a few of them. The, and I'm talking about death, losing people I've loved. Mm. And uh, including my uh, my youngest son died three months ago. Mm. Who's prepared for that? You're prepared for your parents. And that's that's difficult, but... And you know you process that because that's the natural order. Yeah. Probably, um, probably you might lose a spouse. I did, and I went through all of that, and then most recently to lose a child, which is an entirely different loss because that's not the natural order of things. No. So those are things that I found very hard and have you know dealt with as as well as I can. How did your son pass away? Prostate cancer. 
Okay. So when he was young, I'm guessing. Oh yeah, he was in his early fifties. Mm. And uh, and it was a very a very difficult time for him. He was he suffered quite a lot. He lives in he lived in the same town that I do, which my, my two older sons live far away, but he happened to be right here in town. And even though we didn't see each other often, we went, we had our separate lives. I was there for him, and he was there for me. And you know, we get together for holidays and things and all. The loss of a spouse is is very different. A husband dies, or a wife, and a husband dies, and everything changes. You know, you don't have the same person eating dinner with you every night. You don't get up in the morning with the sandy. He's not there in bed at night. He's gone. And yeah. life, is a, that's a huge shock and a huge adjustment. But a son, a child, even though you don't see that child, maybe every couple of months, that's an existential loss, a hole that you could never it's always there. I How think. is it as interesting? How do you find it different? Because with a spouse, wouldn't it also be, I guess, what do you mean by existential as compared to a spouse? Well, you can, you, you, a, a spouse is on the, the daily thing and the intimacy of meals together and that sort of thing. But a child you expect to be there always you know alive always if not always in the same room or yeah. okay. and the um, you don't replace that i have since remarried since the death of my husband oh, I like that took a couple of years to you know to adjust to that to that but i did and i found love again but i'm not going to replace that son okay. i see what you mean okay that's just a big empty space there, where he was. What was the name of your son? Chris. Chris. Mm -hmm. What do you think about life then that you find beautiful? The fact that you never know what's around the next corner. That, that, that every day is can be kind of a surprise, at least in my world it is. I'm always kind of surprised at new people I meet new experiences I have. I have a whole new life that I invented in the last few years of going from being a writer, strictly a writer, was a fairly isolating. I mean, you do that by yourself. And just kind of for fun, on, on the ground floor of this apartment where I'm sitting now, now, right now, which is my studio, there's a little black box theater and they were having and they were doing improv there on weekend nights. And I started going down because I've, I've always loved improv. It's magical. Today. I remember Mike Nichols and Elaine May from, you know, de decades ago and how they can just take something and create something on the spot. Well, they were offering classes and I signed up for one. I am the age of the grandmother of everybody in the class, including the professor, the teacher. I was, you know, 50 years older than the teacher, at least. And they didn't know quite what to do with me. And that was that was very freeing and very fun. And I started doing it. So I was terrified the first few times I did it. And then I kind of thought, oh, it's kind of fun being here in front of an audience. And there are certain parts of it I was better at than others. Somebody could throw out, you know, just want a storyline and they'd toss out you know, just random thing. Uh, I don't know. Talk about a barbecue, talk about, you know, barbecue thing. And I would, I could get up there and I could invent all kinds of crap about bar barbecues. I mean, nothing, nothing at all. Have fun doing it. Well, then I discovered that I have a raunchy streak. And I was invited to do stand up at a local bar. Oh, and wow. I would, I would put on my, my LL Bean, my most conservative clothes, and very little makeup, which I hardly ever do anything. I'm going down there and just go blue. You know what I mean by that. Very blue it means it's really raunchy. And the audience, I'm like, gosh, who's this woman? Look at her. She should be teaching Sunday school. And she's up there talking about how to give blowjobs. What are we going to do, do with it? And I discovered I was really good at it. And I got popular with it. And 
then I decided to develop my own. It was 75 minutes long. Don't call me young lady. And I found myself never having any theater background on stage for 75 minutes, selling out every show. Wow. And I loved it. Loved it. Then I did another one, then COVID came along. Do you like it more than writing? Yeah. Yeah? It's more fun. It's more fun. It's more challenging. I've, I've written more than 60 books. Yeah. I'll do a memoir and that's it. I don't want to do any more. Then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> this is just much more fun. Then I discovered the moth. You know the moth? They're, they are a national storytelling organization. They're now international. And uh, they're on uh, public radio with their shows all the time, podcast. And they came to Albuquerque and they were, you know, you could pitch a story for five minute story. I pitched a story, they ignored me. And a year passed and they got, all of a sudden somebody called me from New York and said, actually, we liked that, that pitch. Can we work with you? Okay. So we developed a 10 minute story. And they started sending me, sending me on the road wow. with the other storytellers. And the, I don't know how much you know about the setup of, of the moss, but they have five storytellers. It has to be a true story. Hmm. And, and it will be a different five people. Various shows. And they travel around cities all around the country. And they, I can remember the first one was somewhere in Utah, Provost, Utah. University then. And I was semi petrified with this. But I I I told my 10 minute story, which is about online dating in your in my age, which they found. And they started using me as their opening story because nobody can believe that this 80-year-old white-haired woman looking like the Sunday school teacher is going to get up there on stage and talk about her experiences on online data. I, and I ended up, I think I've been to a dozen different cities in the last couple of years. They flew me out to London. Wow. And that was that was great. And and I was at their opening. They did a big fundraiser in New York to celebrate their 25th anniversary. And I was there opening act. So that's been real. That I I love doing it. That's but, really exciting. Yeah, that is that is really exciting. So that's. So then, what would you say the meaning of life is for you? A connection with other people, and and the and the, the place that gives me a fit into the world. That I feel I I feel I have a place in the world. And that gives me meaning. And I, I really enjoy the, the different kinds of people that I have met through the moth. The people who run this program are wonderful to begin with. They're great to work with. They drive you crazy because they want everything perfect. But they eventually get what they're, what they're looking for. And then you meet these other people. I would never meet this assortment of people just in my ordinary life. Mm -hmm. And I meet a lot of different people because I put myself out there and try to meet different kinds of people, not to be, yeah. I know I, I, there's a temptation to pigeonhole older people, and especially older women, mm -hmm. that they get together with their little coffee clutch or their little bridge club, and maybe they go on a trip together. Yeah. And I never bought into that. And I'm just finding life really damned exciting and that that i guess you could call that meaning so when you say the meaning of life for you is connection and it's connection yeah. just with people in general so no one in specifically no no just the, the idea that of being open to experiences and through people I mean, I don't, by experiences, I, I'm talking about interpersonal experiences, mm. interpersonal changes, not am I going to go try to climb Everest and then, you know, yeah. that I'm not interested in that kind of adventure. Never have. Been. 
the, phys the physical adventure doesn't appeal to me at all. I'm too much of a chicken for that. But an opportunity to get out and experience different people, different people, different cultures, that appeals to me. Is there something you want to do that you haven't done yet? No. no I don't, I've never had a bucket list. Really? Okay. And that never ha and I've done so many different things and traveled to so many different places with my writing. Um, I'd be hard put to come up with something that I haven't that I've wanted to do that I haven't. So you think you've done everything you've ever wanted to do? Yeah, that I can think of, yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, now I mean doing up this stand up show too, I'm sure that's definitely not something you thought would ever happen and now it is so that's that's yeah. definitely a that that whole thing the stand up and then getting into the storytelling and then it doing a one woman shows i never would have dreamed that i would have done anything like any of that if you told me this 10 years ago that i'd be having this conversation and narrating all the things that have gone on in the last 10 years I'll but it's just been an explosion of all kinds of interesting events. Hmm. Is there an element of nature that you really love or that is special to you in some way? I love, well, again, I'm into change. I really enjoy change. And one of the things about nature, unless it's really being awful, then, you know, hurricanes and wildfires and stuff like that but the changing seasons and yeah they're sort of expected but they're always different they're always new and, and uh, I like that about nature I like living in a in a place where I see all kinds of different mm. manifestations of nature. Uh, living in the southwest is certainly a lot different than growing up in Pennsylvania a whole different kind of nature and to discover in my country, all these different, different climate zones and, you know, all the, the change, the differences, I enjoy that. Do you have a favorite season? Mm, early fall. Yeah? Yeah. Is it the leaves or? Oh, the leaves are so warm, but, you know, I'm, it's not 100 degrees every day, which it has been lately here in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pleasant evenings and and uh, yeah, sun comes up and the sun goes down. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. Is there an animal that you think your personality is most like? Yeah, yeah that question is on your list. I, that, I just draw a zero on that. I, I can't think of anything. I guess maybe a uh, better way is how about is there an animal you really like? Whether it's watching or learning about. Hummingbirds. I have a lot of hummingbirds there. They're beautiful. Yeah. And we have a lot of um, Canada geese flying over and sandhill cranes. And last um, New Year's Eve, we went down to a so it's kind of a nature preserve where the uh, the crane the, the, the geese and the cranes take off late in the afternoon and go to the Flights of birds that are quite dramatic. And that that was that was fun. Do you have hummingbirds where you are? Hummingbirds? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a like a bird feeder, a birdhouse? I had I had a bird feeder, but I'm not. I don't spend enough regular time here in my studio to make sure that it's taken care of every day. I'm trying to keep some flowers alive out there on my balcony, but even there, they're saying, "Where have you been?" Well, I've been this. Do you have a favorite book that you've read? I could only tell you favorite books that I have written. But that's, that wasn't your question. Well, do you, okay. Then is there, what is your favorite book that you've written? It's one of the earlier novels that I wrote. And I was living in 
um, Denton, Texas at the, at the time. My husband was a professor at the University of North Texas. And I, it, it was sort of an odd experience for me because I didn't fit in very well politically. I didn't do my hair, I didn't do my nails. You know. But I was on my way home one day through the, through the, uh, through the park, there's a beautiful park here. And I was cutting through the park from the library where I spent a lot of time to my home. And I came upon this group of black people who were all dressed up and they were there having the dedication of a plaque. Mm. Because the park used to be an entirely black community, African-Americans who had been freed at the end of the Civil War and had settled there. And they had, this was about the, in the 1920s, they were about two or three generations in, a very solid community. But in the 1920s, of course, that was the, the lot of segregation. And the city fathers decided they wanted this area for a city park. So we got we to get rid of all these colored people. Get to, and they, they ran them out of town. Mm. They used to relocated them down near the city dump if they wanted to go down there. Start over again. Many of them left. Many of them joined the, the migration to the north. Some just went to other communities. But a, a little, a little group of them stayed there. They hung on, and they had a tiny community of what was left. Well, I listened to these speeches, and it triggered, as often happens when I'm, you know, sort of in an open mode for a new idea. What well, must it have been like to be? A 12 year old, because that was my readership at the time. A 12 year old kid, girl. And she finds out that her, her home is going to be destroyed or moved. And her family is going to be split up unless they all can figure out a way to stick together. And how does she deal with that? Mm. Well, how, how is her life impacted and how does she react to it? So I created a character, Rosalie Jefferson, and a whole family for her and wrote the story of a novel about how that was, how that, what the life was like there and how this cataclysmic event affected everybody in her family. It was mm -hmm. called White Lilacs and it was very well received and got some nice awards and so forth. And, and that, then, then how is gonna be received in my community? Well, I was invited to talk to the women's club about it. And they were not amused. They had always been very nice to their college folks, and they didn't want me telling them that it had been any different. And then I was invited to come to a class of young black girls from Dallas who had come up for a summer summer camp kind of thing. And they asked me to come in and talk about the book. And I walked in, and these kids, all looked, the girls all looked at me and stared at me. And I, What's up here? And they said, you're white. You wrote that book and you're white? I, yeah. Uh, well, then they were, well, how did you do that? Well, very carefully. Now, what has happened since then, not only were the kids very enthusiastic and I liked the book, but there is now, they call it, they, they renamed the park. Um, what do they call it now? Um, Quaker Town Park. It was initially it was called Quaker Town. I renamed it Qu Freedom Town in my novel, but it was Quaker Town. And now they call it instead of Civic Park, it's Quaker Town Park. They have restored some of the old houses oh. that left, and they now have the Carolyn Meyer tour. <laughs> Nobody asked me about it. I long ago moved from Denton. A friend. My old friend said, do you realize that they have named this tour after you? <laughs> I had no idea, but that's not that was nice. So that I've probably gotten more positive feedback on that book than any other. And and the satisfaction and feeling that it, I I made a difference mm. because it became part of the school curriculum in a lot of schools in Texas. And that was that was that was a validation. That was a long awesome. time ago. And I've written a lot of books since then that have not been had that effect, but I'm I'm proud of that I I feel 
I did a good job mm. and describe things and open people's eyes to different ways of thinking. Is there a time in history you would have lived in if not now? No, I'm a real history buff and I find something interesting and unique in each one. I don't know that I want to live in any of them, but I certainly enjoy exploring them in a, you know, kind of a novelistic literary way. You know, what was it like to be Marie Antoinette as a kid? And she had buck teeth and they had to straighten her teeth. Can you imagine what orthodontia must have been like in whatever century that was? But since since I had buck teeth, that's what another reason I don't want to live in another century and go through that kind of orthodontia. So <laughs> And then the last question for you is, is there a piece of music that you think describes who you are, your personality? I was thinking about that, that question because my mother was a, a trained musician. So I heard a lot of classical music when I was growing up and it's still my, my go-to, you know, I've, I try to be open-minded about the arts, but if, when it goes into the atonal stuff, oh my God. So I, and I find maybe, I don't know if this is my personality or just my background. I really love Bach. Mm, it's beautiful. And uh, one time I had a, a, a friend who had come and fled to me because she was having a terrible time with her husband and her children. and. She was kind of suicidal, and I was trying to reach her shrink, and it was away on vacation. And I said, okay, we're just going to listen to the Brandenburg Concertos. Mm. And that'll bring us both, center us both. And that's what I find about Bach, that it centers me. Mm. And so that's that's I, I guess that would be my answer to that question. Mm. 